Okay, good. All right. So, um, uh, so now, pause. <laughs> um, w the the very next thing on the agenda, right on time at eleven o'clock, is uh, <laughs> Charles Wang. Uh, I want to um, properly introduce him to you. Uh, how many of you have heard of Guitar Hero? All right. Well, Charles is the founder of the Guitar Hero franchise. He created that from scratch when, um, with his co-founder. Um, oh, there you are. <laughs> like that thing is just going I'm by sorry. itself. Um, anyway, uh, and uh, so certainly a, a seasoned entrepreneur, and he's got a. Um, um, a um, so he's got, I'm going to say, just the right background to explain um, the next topic that we want to bring up, which is we'd like to go back into where do ideas come from and um, both his case as well as um, his perspective on it. I think it's enormously interesting. So, and of course, um, it's like a huge favor to get you here. <laughs> and so we really appreciate your time. Charles, I'm going to leave the stage to you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and thank you for playing the game, for those of you who did. <laughs> always, always, always fun to hear that. Um, so this is uh, my sort of personal case study. Can you play with that, or I'm, I think Karen has it, but I'm happy to grab it. Uh, okay, this is fine. I think. Yeah. So, um, case study of, of how we uh, came up with the game Guitar Hero from the beginning of the company until uh, we released the game. Uh, and uh, hopefully it'll uh, shed some insight on how, how we arrived at a series of ideas that eventually led to Guitar Hero. So, we started the, the company back in, uh, as you can see from that article, November 1999. And uh, originally the company was uh, renting video games for PlayStation, uh, back then it was PlayStation 2, Sega Dreamcast, for those of you who play games, you might remember that, <coughs> that era. And uh, we were sending these discs through the mail, much like Netflix early on had sent DVDs through the mail. So it was November 1999, and for those of you who may remember, those were the dot-com bubble days. That was the heyday of the dot-com bubble. Those were good days. Uh, <coughs> very, very, uh, very good days. So. Uh, you could tell that uh, that was a dot-com era by the name of the company. We started off originally as webgamezone.com, online game rentals. So we threw in web and dot-com and online as many times as we could in our name and logo. Uh, and, and we launched in November 1999, and then six months later, the market kind of fell apart on us. So um, these big, enormous companies, you know, the, the stock market tanked in April 2000, these big, enormous companies like Webvan, eToys, um, Pets.com just simply disappeared off the face of the planet. So there we were, six months into our company, um, and, and it didn't look like at that time that there was ever going to be another investment made in another technology startup again. That's how bad it was. Um, I, think, I think people know how bad the, uh, the world financial sort of crisis hit in 2008. Uh, for tech, I think it was a lot worse than that back in 2000 and 2001 and 2002. It literally was uh, sort of Armageddon. Uh, companies were dying every day. <clears throat> so we had to sit there and say, what are we going to do? We're not going to raise money. So uh, we're going to have to find a way to keep this company alive on our own. So we, we looked around at our game rental service to try to figure out what people were doing and uh, try to find a, a way that we could generate revenues and profits. So So... The lessons, early lessons we learned within six months of starting our company was that revenues and profits were more important above all else. Because at that time, without investment dollars, if you couldn't generate profits, your company was dead. So we had to very quickly figure out how we were going to do that, generate revenues and profits. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we're back in the day today where some businesses don't have to generate any revenues and profits, uh, which may or may not last. You never know. But when the day comes, if, it, if that ends, then you will have to generate profits to keep your company going. And that's what we were facing. And so the, the, the second thing that we learned at that time was we didn't know a whole lot about the markets. And so where were we going to get these ideas for, for generating uh, revenues and profits from products? So what we did was we, we decided to listen to our customers, <coughs> consumers. And luckily, because we were doing this directly online, we had a, a direct channel to our customers who were communicating ideas with us. 
So we, we looked at that and we said, what, what were the consumers doing? And so, so we found this, right? And, and th this, for those of you who might remember, was a particular game, uh, a dance game. Uh, there was these dance games that were hugely popular in Asia. Uh, the most popular music games, actually, the most popular of which was a game called Dance Dance Revolution. For those of you who may have played it, and you play it by, by jumping up and down on a pad like these guys are doing on the ground. Um, and it was hugely popular in Asia, but somehow had not really made its way to the US or to Europe. So we looked at these games and we said, oh, that's interesting. There were small audiences of people playing them in the US, but it hadn't really made its way here. So we thought um, that was an interesting market. And we had seen evidence through our game rental service that there were people in the United States renting these games from us. And what they were asking for at the time was, well, these games aren't very fun to play with a game controller. Do you have the dance pads that sit on the ground that we can play with? <clears throat> and we thought, well, if people are asking for those, why don't we try to sell those to them? So that was essentially our first product that we had created was a dance pad. Um, <clears throat> so we, we, we went and created our, our own dance pad. And then what happened was, uh, because we had this direct conversation with our consumers, the first pads that we sold were absolutely horrible. They were breaking down after two or three uses, and people luckily were sending us information back and telling us, uh, you know, for, for all the customer service uh, feedback that you get, 95% of it, maybe 99% of it is junk, but every once in a while, you get customers who will actually tell you how to fix your products. And so we were reading through, my brother and I who started the company together, uh, we were reading through this, the, the customer service emails, people returning products, telling us why our products were horrible, and some of them telling us how to fix them. So we gathered up a list of, of the fixes that they suggested. Uh, I had a little bit of manufacturing in my background, so I packed my bags, went off to China, found some factories that were making these, and basically went through the list and said, this is the product we like to make. So, so we, we, we started making our own uh, dance pads, and then we improved on them through the customer service feedback and, and gradually made a better dance pad. Um, and, and we kept making better and better products just through this process of listening to the consumers tell us how our products were failing and how we could improve upon them. <clears throat> and eventually we started making the most or the best selling dance pads in the United States. And believe it or not, a, a little product like this was what kept our company afloat after the dot com bubble had burst. So, so we were able to, at a very small scale, uh, generate enough profits from selling dance pads and, and creating dance pads to be able to uh, sustain our business through the dot-com bust. So there, there we were, you know, a few years later, we're now sort of breaking even, and we're trying to figure out uh, what we could do next. And, um, you know, what happened at the time was the dance pads were <coughs> products, hardware that went along with a game Dance Dance Revolution at the time that was created by a Japanese co company called Konami. And, uh, you know, we realized after speaking with Konami, we asked them, hey, are you ever going to bring this game officially to the United States? And they said, nah, we just don't think there's much of a market for music games in the U.S. And we talked to some other people who pretty much expressed the same sentiment that, well, we don't think these games, even though they're hugely popular in Asia, we don't think these games will work in the West for a variety of reasons. <clears throat> and what we learned at that time was we had to be in control of our own future. Because we couldn't grow our market unless other companies were willing to step in, as, as, <clears throat> um, as you learned about earlier, in the ecosystem. So we, had, we were dependent, our hardware was dependent on a piece of software that was developed by another company, a partner company, who was not interested in bringing that product to the United States. So we were kind of stuck, and we weren't able to control our own future. So that was the next expansion that we decided at that point was, well, if we're going to control our own future, we're going to have to make our own software. Um, and, and so it, eventually we started working on our first game, which was a dance game called In the Groove. Um, and it was pretty much a sort of a, a, a better version of Dance Dance Revolution. So by better, I mean we took a lot of the gameplay uh, up the difficulty level. Uh, Dance Dance Revolution was a game created by Japanese developers, had a lot of songs that were kind of uh, J-pop. Uh, and, and a mixture of songs that we really didn't think fit with the U.S. or European audience. So we took uh, a bunch of English songs, sort of unknown English songs, um, and genres that were more popular in the West, and we put them in the game. And the, and the game did commercially okay. It was, uh, it was decent. It took our company from about a $3 million revenue base just off of the uh, dance pads and grew it to about $9 million. Um, and primarily, it allowed us to do two things. One, we were now in, in, I said, in control of our own future. We were able to make software and develop hardware and, and bring those to market. 
But we also learn a lot more from, again, the consumers about this specific product of music games. So we learned that just by putting English songs in the game, it wasn't really enough, that we had to go a lot deeper into, into music and into creating this product. And so uh, from there, we decided to work on our second product, which was Guitar Hero, second video game. So Guitar Hero started off originally based on everything we had learned previously. We had seen this other game in Japan called Guitar Freak. So it was an arcade game. It was an, an, another Konami game. Very fun, very popular. We had people sitting around at our offices playing the game. Um, and, and that was one of the things. Is we had a group of, uh, of, of people in the company, who, myself included, who were huge music game fans. People who were staying in at lunch, staying after work just to play these games. And several of them had bought these games on their own and brought them to the office so they could share with other people who were interested in playing these games. So we had a bunch of people just sitting around always talking about how are we going to make these games popular? these Japanese games, very popular in the West. So we knew we'd put in English songs, and that wasn't enough. So we saw this Guitar Freaks game, and we decided, let's go farther. If we're going to make a, a game about a guitar, it should be about rock and roll. And it should be about everything that is rock and roll. So from the aesthetics of the game and the characters and the songs, we wanted to dive deep into rock and roll culture. And, and the objective of the game from the beginning was to make you feel like you were a rock star. Right? It was, uh, the tagline of the game was, unleash your inner rock star. And so that was what we set off to do, was to create a game, not to teach you to play guitar, not to teach you about rock and roll music, but to make you feel for that instant that you're playing like you were an actual rock star. So a lot of the effects in the game that you remember uh, were, you know, as you were, doing, as you were doing well, the crowd starts to get louder and cheer, and you could activate star power where they go crazy and start to cheer you. And when that happens, for that instant, you feel like, hey, I'm actually playing this song, and people are actually cheering me on. And that was the illusion that we wanted to create. And that was essentially what went into Guitar Hero. So we talked to a, uh, a, a software development house in Boston that we had known for several years called Harmonix Music System. Uh, they're a bunch of uh, MIT Media Labs folks who have been working on interesting music uh, technologies. So we collaborated with them. Uh, they created the software. We created the hardware. Uh, we provided the funding. Uh, we provided the, uh, the sales and marketing <coughs> and, and uh, handled all the hardware production. So again, it was you know, dependent uh, go on going out into the marketplace and finding partners that would share some of the risk with us. And we developed Guitar Hero. Came together re relatively quickly. We um, probably spoke to them first about this project in uh, February of 2005. And we said, hey, we've been thinking about doing this uh, guitar game. And they said, hey, that's funny. We've been thinking about doing a guitar game. And then we started brainstorming about it. And pretty soon we realized, wow, hey, a lot of our ideas are similar. And we got together and we started making Guitar Hero. And, um, uh, and, and we made it with a target of showing it first at this trade show called E3, the Electronics Entertainment Expo in LA. It's the biggest video game trade show in the world. Um, and, and, and what was funny was, uh, just to give you a sort of backstory of that, we, 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 they were developing the software in Boston. We were developing all the hardware in, uh, in the Bay Area. And um, <clears throat> we had a very aggressive timeline to have a working demo at the show. And so it was so, uh, so compressed that uh, literally we had not been able to test our hardware with their software. They flew in from Boston with a disk of their latest build. We had a box of uh, hardware controllers shipped from China directly to the trade show in LA. And when, it, when everybody showed up at the booth the night before, we put it together and we were just praying, like, my god, I hope this thing works. Because we had a, a booth of demos and all these journalists that were coming to see the product and we hadn't even tested it yet. And, uh, and luckily for us, it, it all worked. It actually worked out well. It came out of that, that show, that, uh, that E3, and nominated for one of the best games uh, of the show. So um, we were, we were uh, I'll go to this. We were there, uh, coming out of E3, uh, got all these accolades, nominated for best of show. We decided we needed to go out and raise some money. So um, <clears throat> that summer to fund the launch. So we, we go out, we start speaking to, to investors, and um, couldn't, couldn't raise a dime. <laughs> so uh, well, part of the reasons we couldn't give a dime, some of the examples, like somebody told us, we don't invest in hit-driven businesses. And uh, at the time, uh, we, we thought our response was, well, isn't the VC business a hit-driven business? <clears throat> Which they would say, yes, it is, but it doesn't work like your business does. <laughs> And, and, and looking back at it later, I can understand why, the, why uh, they were reluctant. Because uh, in the video game business, they would say, you show us three driving games, and we can't really tell you which driving game is going to sell better. 
And it's probably true because even in our business, being people who make video games, it's very hard for us to tell which games will really sell well versus other games. Um, and um, that's just one of the natures of, you know, people, it's why famous directors make, every once in a while, they'll, they'll, they'll make a movie that's a bomb, right? Um, you just don't always have that, that knowledge. It's, it's, it's an art, not really a, a, a science when you make entertainment products, right? <clears throat> great, great singers and songwriters write songs all the time that, that aren't very good. And it's, again, it's, when it's an art rather than a science, it's very difficult. Uh, we had some investors tell us, you know, that looks like a fantastic game, but too bad you're going to go out of business trying to sell it. And, and, and so the, the, the perennial belief was they looked at the sales data and said, Americans don't buy music games. And, uh, and sure, if you look at the sales data, that was absolutely true. But uh, the one thing we learned about that was sales data is inherently a backwards-looking sort of uh, uh, forecast, right? It, so, so you can only tell what it sold in the past. It, doesn't, it gives you some idea what might sell in the future, but it's not a, a, a clear 100% look at what's in the future. So you do have to take a, a reasonable guess at what's coming in the future. Um, sales data helps, but it, it, it can't tell you completely 100% of, of what might or might not sell. And the last one there was my favorite. We had an investor tell us later. He said, you know, I couldn't really bring you in front of the full partnership because you were really just two random brothers with a plastic guitar. <laughs> uh, which, in fact, I think if you, if, if you really think object, uh, you know, sort of objectively about some of the business ideas, some of them at the beginning do just sound crazy. Um, and, and the idea of selling a video game with a plastic guitar that you play was kind of crazy if you, if you, if you sit back and kind of look at it. But we had enough experience specifically with in uh, music games, and as I said, we had a direct line to the consumer, that we were confident we could sell some amount of Guitar Hero. Uh, we didn't know that it would be a hit, but we were confident that we could sell some amount that we could recoup our investment in it. Um, and uh, it wasn't a huge investment. I, we had spent, uh, because we were bootstrapped, we didn't have a lot of money to spend. Uh, we were bootstrapping this out of the profits of the company. So we had spent, I think, $1.75 in the development of Guitar Hero 1. So our goal, modest as it, as it might seem, was just to make enough money back so we could recoup the $1.75 million. Uh, we weren't actually thinking at that time uh, about building a, a, a humongous video game franchise. So, so there we were. Um, you know, we, we, we tried to raise money in the summer, uh, and we couldn't. Couldn't raise a, uh, like I said, we couldn't raise a penny. From, uh, from venture capitalists. So <clears throat> um, we had to figure out how to launch this game because we, the way it works with uh, retail, as most of you know, you know, we have to build these guitars in China, we have to pay for them, comes here, we sell them to uh, people like Toys R Us or Walmart or, or GameStop, and they don't pay us for probably 60 days. Those are the terms of trade. So you have to have a lot of capital that goes into this, uh, uh, into this supply chain before you get any money back as an entrepreneur. So your working capital gets tied up uh, uh, for probably at least 90 days or so when you're, when you're dealing with a product that goes into retail like we were. So we needed some money, and we couldn't raise any money. So where were we going to get the money to launch this game? Well, so, so we basically, my brother and I decided, well, it seems like a safe enough risk because based on the reviews of the product and what we knew about the market, that we could make back our $1.75 million. So we thought, let's just go ahead and we just take out a bunch of debt. So we borrowed every penny we could on credit cards. Uh, I went home and talked to my wife and said, hey, honey, I think we should take out a second mortgage on the house so we could uh, pay for Guitar Hero inventory. And uh, at the time, we had two young daughters uh, uh, <clears throat> at that time. And, and she said, well, where are the kids going to live if this game doesn't sell? And, uh, and, and the best answer I had at the time was, well, I think the game will sell. <clears throat> and... Uh, <laughs> Luckily, and I hope all of you do have spouses that are very supportive of your entrepreneurial career, uh, she, she was uh, willing to uh, let me take out a second mortgage on the house. Uh, so we borrowed every penny we could, essentially, to launch Guitar Hero 1. Um, and so part of the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of the dirty secret, Guitar Hero 1 comes out and it instantly sells out everywhere. Um, and part of the dirty secret to why it sold out everywhere was we didn't have a lot of money to pay for inventory. <laughs> Because right? it was basically every penny we could borrow went into inventory. We didn't have enough money to do any advertising. We didn't have enough money to do basically anything other than just buy uh, units of Guitar Hero. So um, we, we didn't ship a lot. It goes out and it gets sold out everywhere. Uh, <clears throat> wildly above forecast. Uh, Best Buy, one of our, uh, they were one of two retail partners that even bothered to take the product. Um, 
a lot of the retailers also told us that we don't think this product is going to sell very well because of, again, sales data of uh, other music games that had come previous to Guitar Hero. So Best Buy had given us a forecast. They thought they could sell 30,000 units of Guitar Hero over the Christmas season. We're releasing mid-November, so mid-November, December, and January, they thought they could sell 35,000 units. And by noon of the first day, they called us and said, hey, we sold 3,000 units in the first two hours, and we need 80,000 units next week. And we said, no, 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 you don't understand. These guitars are built in China, <laughs> and they come over on a boat. <laughs> and next week, next week we get 5,000 units, and you have to split that with the other retailer, GameStop. So it instantly became the hardest game to find that Christmas season. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, <clears throat> what happened was uh, it released in November. Uh, December was the first full month in the marketplace. Uh, sales data for <clears throat> retail uh, sales of video game products comes out in January. Uh, and it turned out Guitar Hero was the second best-selling game that Christmas season. And it was only number two because it was sold out everywhere. If we had more inventory, it would have been the best-selling game. So everybody in the industry knew that that was the hottest game in the industry. They just didn't know what the true demand was. They knew that every unit you, you put into the marketplace, you sold. Uh, in fact, we had some anecdotal evidence from some retailers. Uh, GameStop told us some of their store clerks were answering the phones that Christmas season. They just pick up the phone without even asking, and they say, no, we don't have Guitar Hero. And, then they hang up. and somebody else calls, they say, no, we don't have Guitar Hero. And then they hang up. <laughs> um, and so, so we, we came out of their best-selling game. The minute the data comes out, we started getting calls from private equity firms saying, hey, you guys have a real hot product. We'd like to help you expand, and we're willing to invest $30 million in your company. Now, when we were out fundraising, we were only trying to raise $3 million. And we were trying to three, raise $3 million, for those of you who've been on fundraising before, uh, on a $15 million uh, pre-money valuation. So say in our company before, which had done $9 million in revenues and netted almost three, saying that our company, which those financials, nine and three, were worth 15 and we couldn't get a penny. And so all of a sudden, a month and a half later, we had people calling us saying they were willing to give us $30 million. And I look at my brother and say, wow, you know, three or four months ago, Nobody would give us $3 million, and now people are calling us. They want to give us $30 million. This is crazy. Um, and, and literally, the, the, the first day that we got a term sheet over from one of these private equity firms, um, a company called Activision called us up, and they said, hey, we'd like you to come down and talk to us. We're very interested in, in, in working with you on the game. So, um, so what happens when you make a hit game is a company like Activision calls you. They offer you a lot of money to buy your company, and we ended up selling the company to them in uh, June of uh, 2006. It ended up closing uh, uh, a bit uh, fitting, perhaps, for the game like Guitar Hero on June 6, 2006. So the, the legal counsel made a joke about how it was 666 was the day that we closed that, that deal. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we ended up selling the company for, uh, for, for $150 million. And I remember turning to my brother, like, you know, nine months ago, we couldn't raise $3 million <laughs> on a $15 million valuation. And now somebody's going to give us 150 for this company. Is this crazy? Uh, and I was beginning to understand now what people, we didn't really understand what, when people said it's a hit-driven business, what that meant till we had a hit. And when you have a hit in a hit-driven business, uh, like a, a, you know, a lot of these industries today that you, some of you might be thinking about, mobile apps, consumer mobile apps, uh, entertainment, when you have a hit in a hit-driven business, it just skyrockets like crazy. Um, and we, when we got a hit uh, with Guitar Hero, it just went crazy. So you know, Activision bought us that year. It went from uh, our sales the previous year were 9 million. It grew to 50 the first year that we released Guitar Hero. It would have been a lot more if we had any money for inventory. Um, so Guitar Hero, then, uh, we were acquired by Activision. We become part of Activision. It becomes the best-selling video game in the world for calendar year 2007 and 2008. It was the fastest video game to reach a billion dollars in sales annually. So by 2007, the, the trajectory of a hit in a hit-driven business looks something like this, at least with Guitar Hero. We did 45 million with Guitar Hero 1, almost 50. 40, uh, with Guitar Hero 1, Guitar Hero 2, we did 300. Guitar Hero 3, we did 1.1 billion. Um, and then Guitar Hero 4, we did 1.5 billion. So there were three consecutive years where we, we did over a billion dollars in sales. It was the second video game in the history of the industry, for those of you who play games, to do a billion a, a year in sales. The first was a game called World of Warcraft. Uh, and then Guitar Hero was the second, and Call of Duty ended up being the third. I think there have been one or two other games now that have crossed a billion. I think uh, Candy Crush has, cr uh, has crossed a billion a year. Uh, um, and so, so we were the second game in the history that crossed a billion dollars a year. It became this pop culture phenomenon. Uh, Ellen DeGeneres started playing it on the Ellen show. 
<coughs> uh, we, we, are, you know, we appeared uh, on The Simpsons. Um, uh, there, there was a, a South Park episode did entire, made entirely uh, uh, based on Guitar Hero. Uh, it was called Guitar Quiro. Uh, <laughs> but when they first told us they were doing this, uh, they, we could do an episode on Guitar Hero. We thought, oh, this could be really bad. Because <laughs> right? they lampoon things. And, 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 and because they do parodies, they don't need licensing or approvals from anybody. They could do anything they want uh, uh, about your product. And so at first we thought, oh, this could be really bad. Uh, but then it turned out pretty good. They told us afterwards it was the number one rated episode of that season. And ended up being featured as uh, the front of their DVD set for that year. And uh, we, we, we got a lot of uh, uh, comments uh, from that South Park episode. I got a lot of emails from friends saying, hey, I saw your product on South Park last night. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we were able to, to grow Guitar Hero from this little um, uh, niche product, which uh, was funny. Uh, when we started, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, the music licensing side of that. When we started uh, Guitar Hero 1, we went out to license music, right? And uh, when we went to ask the labels and the artists, we didn't really have a game to show. So we said, we want to license uh, your song for a game called Guitar Hero. And they say, well, what is it? And we couldn't show anything. So we could only tell them about this game called Guitar Hero. So we couldn't get anybody to give us their original recordings for Guitar Hero 1. We had to get approval rights, and then we would re-record the music to sound like it was the original, for those of you who may have played Guitar Hero 1. <clears throat> so, uh, except we got, we got one original, which was uh, from uh, uh, an artist called Zach Wilde. He was Ozzy Osbourne's guitar player, and he had started his own band called the Black Label Society. And when his manager went and said, hey, hey uh, Zach, they want to license uh, one of your songs for a game called Guitar Hero, Zach said, if they're making a game called Guitar Hero, I should be in it. Go ahead and give them the song. <clears throat> and his manager says, okay, they're going to re-record the song. He said, no, 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 no. Nobody re-records my music. Give them the original. And that was literally how we got the first original for Guitar Hero. And then by two, there was an artist, uh, a guitar player by the name of Buckethead. For those of you who, who, who may know, Buckethead has toured with Guns N' Roses. Uh, the reason he's called Buckethead is because he actually plays on stage with a Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket over his head. Uh, very sort of eccentric guy. Uh, he, out of the blue, sends us a, 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 a message saying, hey, I love your game. I'm going to write you a song. And that was basically all he said. <laughs> and then he sent in the song that he said, this is going to be the hardest song in Guitar Hero 2. So he wrote a song. He called it Jordan, named it after Michael Jordan, because he said this is going to be the hardest song any guitar player can play. And we put it in Guitar Hero 2. It got picked up by some music industry uh, trade magazines as saying, hey, there's a song written by a known guitarist, Buckethead, and the first time that anybody, it will be as heard in Guitar Hero 2. It's the first time anybody in the world is going to hear about it is in Guitar Hero 2 in a video game. So that got some notoriety within the music industry, which helped propel us to Guitar Hero 3, where all of a sudden as the song, uh, as the, uh, the game grew in popularity, and as all these artists were seeing other known artists participate, by Guitar Hero 3 we were able to get, I think, 75% uh, of all the songs were originals. In fact, we had some, some uh, artists like Living Color actually told us when we wanted to license one of the songs, said, we don't think the solo in that song is hard enough. We're going to re-record that song with a harder solo for you. Uh, we went to license the Sex Pistols music. And uh, for those of you who know the Sex Pistols, right, 60s and 70s punk band, uh, completely appropriate for that band, all of their original recordings have been lost or stolen, right? Which is <laughs> exactly what you would expect to happen to the Sex Pistols. <laughs> Uh, so we went to, to try to license music, and they, the, the label said, we can't find any of their original recordings. <laughs> and, and then the band said, uh, well, if you pay for studio time, we'll get back together and re-record those three songs that you want. And we thought, of course we'll pay for studio time. Um, but then we thought, you know, some of you may know, um, uh, one of the band members, Sid Vicious, died in a, a double homicide in a hotel in, in, in London. Um, and so we thought, well, what are you going to do without Sid? And they <laughs> said, oh, no, you know, Sid wasn't even on the first album. He was actually in the hospital with hepatitis. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so we thought, oh, this is an interesting story. So we said, yeah, we'll pay for the studio time. You guys record it. And by the way, would you mind if we recorded some B-roll of you guys talking about things like that and getting back in studio for the first time in 20-something years and talking about how Sid was in the hospital with hepatitis? And they said, no, no. So, so Johnny Rotten and, and Steve Jones got back together, re-recorded the uh, three songs for us, and we did some B-roll of them talking about that. And uh, they actually ended up doing two concert dates, first time since they broke up. Uh, they did a concert date in London and a concert date in L.A. as a result of uh, getting back together and playing for Guitar Hero. Uh, and so we went from that to then eventually doing a uh, you know entire compilations with like Aerosmith. We did Guitar Hero Aerosmith, 
uh, Guitar Hero Metallica version. So the, the, the brand just grew and grew uh, over time. Um, and um, it, it eventually became, as I said, the, you know, the best-selling video game franchise in the world uh, for 2007 and 2008. Um, and we, we made a couple other derivative products uh, called Band Hero and DJ Hero. Uh, DJ Hero in particular was our take on uh, what we thought was an interesting formula that we had with Guitar Hero, which was we took an intersection of a specific kind of instrument and a genre of music that had a very deep culture in it. And so we thought hip hop uh, and, and some electronica had very deep cultures that resonated with consumers. So we wanted to create that experience of you uh, uh, living out a fantasy as a DJ. So we worked with some, some, some very famous DJs uh, and, and uh, you know, including Daft Punk, David Guetta, uh, Grandmaster Flash, and some others, and created a product called DJ Hero. It was not as successful as Guitar Hero, but it was still the best-selling new video game of, uh, what was that year, 2009. So, so DJ Hero, um, Band Hero, and we, we had a few other derivative products of the same uh, music game genre that, that we aim to create. But um, um, we, we got, as far as doing DJ Hero, one of the things that we learned uh, through that time, uh, which was kind of an interesting lesson, was um, you know, being in a hit-driven business, you tend to drive the biggest franchises you had. And Guitar Hero being a billion dollar franchise drove incredible economics for, for Activision, a publicly traded company at the time. And so there was a lot of, um, a, a lot of, uh, uh, pressure to really drive the biggest revenue driver in the company, um, which I think is something hopefully all of you as entrepreneurs, as you get successful, you will have uh, one or two products that become hugely popular. And uh, at that time, you start making decisions about um, you know, what you're willing to devote your time and company's resources to. So we, we, we had these uh, other products in Guitar Hero. And then my brother and I um, ended up, um, after a four-year run at Activision, uh, when we joined Activision, uh, it was the second big, biggest video game company in the world, and by the time we left, it had merged with Blizzard, which makes World of Warcraft and StarCraft to become the biggest video game company in the world. And after four years of, of doing Guitar Hero, we just thought, oh, it's time to do something different. So we left uh, uh, back in 2010 and have been working on some other projects. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to uh, stop there and leave some time for uh, Q&A. Uh -huh. Hi, thank Hi. you. I was wondering about the decision to sell the company with Activision. Was too soon? What's your thoughts about that? <laughs> yeah, the, uh, that's, uh, there was a, uh, it was funny, there was a, a Wall Street analyst who we had known, a gentleman named Michael Pachter, who we showed Guitar Hero 1 to. And uh, I saw him a couple of years later at uh, Tokyo Game Show. And uh, he told me, he said, wow, you know, when you first showed me Guitar Hero, I had no idea it would become this big. And he said, clearly you didn't either, or else you wouldn't have sold the company, right? <laughs> now, I, I think um, I, I, this, this is a, a hint that I got uh, early on in my entrepreneurial career from a, a, a mentor. And, um, you know, you can follow it up. But he told me, he, he said, basically, when you start a company and you have co-founders, you should have a discussion about what the expectations are. And he called uh, this thing a magic number of how much you'd be willing to walk away from this if somebody were to pay you personally. So how much do you need to, to get paid to walk away from this company? And he said, hopefully you and your co-founders have roughly the same you know, uh, uh, range for that. So if somebody says, oh, I, I'd, I'd sell if, if somebody gave me a million dollars, and somebody else said, I'm not selling unless somebody gives me a billion dollars, then you might have a problem <laughs> one day. Uh, so he, he, from the beginning, he kind of told us, if somebody gives you that, then uh, you should probably take the offer. Uh, and so, as we went along, it took us years. It took us six years to get to Guitar Hero 1. And when the offer came along, we had hired a CEO at, at the time, who was um, formerly the CEO of a, a game company called Take-Two Interactive. So they make a game called Grand Theft Auto. Uh, and uh, he was CEO of that company uh, when it was a public company for a long time. So there was some consideration. He told us, first of all, he said, you know, you guys don't have any money. And if somebody's offering that kind of money to you, you should probably take it. Number one. Number two, he gave us some very, very sort of tactical information about what it's like to be part of a public company. He said, if we do well in the next two years, we could probably go public. But your stock in a public company isn't always liquid. 
You know, he said when he was CEO of a public company and he tried to sell 8,000 shares when he had a million shares, he said he'd get calls from analysts saying, hey, Kelly, why are you selling your 8,000 shares? You guys not going to make the quarter? And he said it became very difficult uh, in that situation to sell any stock. Uh, and so there was a bunch of information that, um, that we got and in, in, in sort of we put together in that decision. Um, and, you know, I think um, looking back on it, um, don't really have any regrets for, uh, for selling the company. I think the, um, you know, th those of you who are going on this path, um, I, I, I recommend you sort of remember your first year or your first two years. And uh, by the time I got to year six, I had forgotten how hard the first two years were. <laughs> and then when we sold the company and I had to start all over, I went back and sat in an office by myself. And, 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 you know, I was half jokingly, my brother and I decided to get an office and I walked in there. And, and I decided, hey, there's no water here. I said, who do I tell to get water? I said, oh, it's me. I'm the only guy in the office. <laughs> and we used to have an entire company of people doing all kinds of stuff. And now it's suddenly back to me again. Uh, so starting from the beginning was the only part. Having to start from the beginning is the only part that I regret from selling. There, there was, uh, is there, should Over we go here. by microphones? Oh, yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Hey, so um, thanks for sharing all of that. And um, going back to your decision to take that uh, second mortgage, right? And, yes. and your <laughs> wife saying, you know, where are our daughters going to live uh, if this doesn't work? So, uh, uh, you know, we don't get to hear a lot of homeless entrepreneurs who fail <laughs> present <laughs> to a group of people. Yes. So sometimes the, the difference between persistence and stupidity can yes. only be assessed in hindsight. Yes. So uh, any oh. advice, so Take us back to that moment when you're making that decision, yes. which many of us will likely face. Yes, yeah, that is a great point, because I don't recommend all of you go out and borrow <laughs> against credit cards and, and, and whatever assets you may own. Don't do that. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't the point of this story. So um, I, I will say this, that when you, uh, when you grow your company up in an environment that we did, which means the only money that you had, the only access to capital were the profits that your company could generate, you think about everything differently. You think about money differently, right? There are no investors that come bail you out. You saw the e-ink. Uh, you know, there was always an investor that bailed them out. We never had that option. There was never going to be an investor that bailed us out. The only way we could survive for another year was we had to generate enough profits to, to be able to go on for another year. And when you grow up in that environment, you think about money differently. I, I, I throw this analogy out. It's like shopping with cash in your pockets versus credit cards. With a credit card, you buy whatever you feel like. You say, hey, I like this. I'll buy it. With cash, if you have $100 of cash in your pocket and you go to the mall, that's all you're buying is $100 worth of stuff. Right? You're not coming back with $200 worth of stuff unless you steal it. Uh, <clears throat> and, and so we grew up in that environment of like the only, the only thing that we ever thought about was how do we survive based on the cash flow and, and the, uh, the profits that we were generating. And it was how we ran our company. Every single week, we looked at the financials. Every single week, we started looking at by like cash flow. How much profits did we make last week? Right? And that was profits and revenues above all else, as I said. It was really how we ran the company. On a weekly basis, we were looking at cash flow, which is something that is a discipline that not a lot of other people have. Um, I will say, just as a tangent, it paid off well, because when we joined, uh, we were acquired by a public company. If you ever get to that point where you either are acquired or go public yourself, the financial discipline changes completely because you're now talking about quarterly financial reports and you're talking about 13 week sprints where you have to report financials and everything becomes driven by financials again. So we were already living sort of out that discipline. So, so to your question about how we made that decision, it was simply we had invested 1.75 million in and what were our chances of getting back 1.75 million based on the POs that we thought we were you know, uh, promised by retailers and the reviews that we were getting. And we thought there was a pretty good chance that we would earn back that 1.75 million because all it would probably would have taken was maybe $10, $10 million worth of sales for us to do that. We had no idea we would sell 50 million, you know, 45, 50 million dollars in that first year. We were simply doing a calculation of, uh, I think who was it? Uh, I might have read this, Richard Branson uh, a long time ago always talked about like, you minimize the downside first and then you try to maximize the upside. So our downside was we have to survive. Whatever we lose on this game, we cannot be out of business. So uh, we looked at that and we said we could probably make back most, if not all, of that 1.75 million we invested. And then from there, we'll see if there's upside. And, uh, and luckily for us, the, it, it worked out. But I, 
would say that, yeah, if you, if you ever are in that decision, you, you look at you know, the downside first before you, you go out and mortgage your house. <laughs> Uh, yes, there was a oh, microphone. Um, can you explain how did you use your money when you get the first um, private equity investment? Oh, so um, we ended okay. up not taking the, the investment. We ended up selling the company at the time. Oh, so you didn't take any. Right. And there was a couple of interesting things uh, around, around that time. So um, today, you as entrepreneurs will have different options to, as they say, take money off the table, right? So you will be able to sell some of your stock. For some reason, back in 2005 and six, that was not an option. If an entrepreneur wanted to sell any shares, it was viewed as lack of confidence in their core business. Uh, and so nobody ever talked about that. When, when we got a call from Activision, the private equity investors simply told us, well, good luck. Let us know if you want to come back and talk to us. But nobody came along and said, hey, how about you each sell, say, $5 million of your shares so you could pay off that second mortgage and your wife can be happy and then we can go on. That, that was not an option on the table. So times have changed. Um, so we, we, at that time, we had an option to either sell or to take the investment. Um, and um, the second thing I, I just wanted to say about that is we, as a result, I didn't know it at the time, but, but I've talked to others. Uh, we, never, we, we ended up never taking uh, investment from VCs or private equity funds. And I think we, uh, I've asked a whole bunch of friends who are in the investment community, VCs and private equity investors, about any other companies you've run across that have exited for whatever, pick a number, 100 million or more, that never took VC backing. And uh, the only other example I've ever been able to get back was I think a friend of mine said he thought VMware exited without taking any VC money. And um, it's something that's not commonly thought of. I think the orthodox, in, especially in the Bay Area, is you start a company, you come up with an idea, you go get investors, VC investors who back your idea, and then you go out and build a great company. Um, but you know, my experience is that even if that doesn't work for you, there are other options. right? Um, not getting VC money doesn't mean it's the end for your business. If you can find a way to generate profits and revenues and run a business like that, it's perfectly fine. Um, um, so so you know, I, I don't think you should uh, be, be constrained by uh, how you're going to get capital for your business. 99% um, of the businesses in the world just start with you know, the, the, the founders' capitals and they generate profits. Uh, did you have a yeah, follow-up? Can, can I oh. take that final? Oh, okay, okay. Oh, uh, that, that, well, that's pretty easy because we, um, we, we actually just put all of our money into, uh, <laughs> into the inventory because the game was reviewed so well, we figured we didn't need any help marketing and it was selling out. So if you have a product that's selling out, don't bother advertising to try to generate more demand because it doesn't translate into dollars. Uh, okay, so, okay, so fi final question, sorry. Just a quick question. Going back to your first business idea, do you think you pivoted too early? And by that, I mean, what do you think of Gamefly? Uh, yeah, so Gamefly came a few months after us, and I did actually have a chance to talk to uh, a Sequoia investor who had invested early in Gamefly, and he said, he said they were really thankful that we changed our business and started making games because <laughs> they, they didn't have a competitor. Um, uh, we, we simply looked at it as um, there was heavy working capital costs to that business model of buying a bunch of discs and then renting it out to people. You know, it was costing us uh, uh, $40 a disc for games, and we were renting three of them out, so that's $120 of cost, and getting back $20 a month from them. So it would take six months to recoup that investment. So if a, a million people wanted to sign up tomorrow, we couldn't do it because we didn't have that money. So we just thought it was an unsustainable business model for us uh, because of the working capital. So we kind of walked away without looking back on it, really. So, okay, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time.